Hello, everybody, and welcome to Narrative. At a minute after noon on January the 20th, 2025, as the 47th president finishes taking his oath, I will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States, he'll say. After that moment, Donald Trump will be the 47th president of the United States. And as he's sworn in, his government in waiting will immediately assume their positions at the top of all the key agencies. They will then attempt to begin a systemic bloodletting of government officials. They'll use extraordinary new powers to fire liberals in every part of the U.S. government and replace them with conservatives. Not long after that, if Steve Bannon is to be believed, 3,000 journalists who had been critical of Trump up until then will be rounded up and thrown into jail. That's designed to send a chill through the entire media ecosystem, which is exactly what Trump wants because it'll mean less scrutiny for what he's about to do next. The National Guard will be ordered to start rounding up illegal immigrants, 11 million in total. If the National Guard can't or refuses, Trump says he'll deploy the army, and he says he can do that because immigrants are not civilians. Trump intends to prioritize retribution in every form, but especially at the Department of Justice, where he intends to order attorneys to prosecute anyone he chooses. And if they refuse, well, he can fire them, he says. We know all of this because of a remarkable piece of reporting in Time magazine. If he wins, Trump plans to overhaul everything we know as being American. What makes this blueprint even more alarming is a CNN poll last week which showed that Trump was leading Biden by six points, 49 to 43, in the national polls. Now, the CNN poll may be an outlier, but considering the plans Trump has to be the new American Fuhrer, as detailed in the magazine, there is a lot to be concerned about. Rachel Bittercoffer is a renowned political scientist turned election strategist who's gained recognition for her accurate election forecasts. Her predictions are based on fundamental voter demographics and her keen understanding of partisan polarization and negative partisanship. Rather than simply following the polls, she follows her instincts, and she gets it right more often than she's wrong. In her book, Hidden Where It Hurts, How to Save Democracy by Beating Republicans at Their Own Game, she offers a blueprint to Democrats, how they can beat Republicans in this new Trump era. And Rachel joins us tonight. Rachel. I, I was very distressed um, after that CNN poll came out on Sunday morning. It's showing a six-point lead for Donald Trump over Biden in, in a national poll. I know you don't love looking at polls, but that one was that one caught me by surprise. I was ready to hit the panic alarm. But you're saying to me, not yet hit the panic alarm? Or do you think we're, we're close to that stage where we should be? Well, have you spent all day obsessing over the new polling that, sh- that shows uh, from Maris that shows Biden is leading in all the swing states? I haven't seen that The one. answer is no, you are not. <laughs> right? <laughs> so here, let me tell you, Zephyr, the only thing that we can, that, that polling can tell us this cycle is something that we already know, okay? This is going to be a toss-up election. It is going to come down to seven swing states and just 10, 20, 30, 40,000 votes in those swing states. Biden has advantages with incumbency, the war chest, the transition to the general, and he's not sitting in in court facing felony charges, right? Mm -hmm. But he is the incumbent, and Trump is a different kind of challenger because we've never had an an ex-president running. So basically, we have a two-incumbent cycle this year Mm -hmm. with high name ID for both, and a lot, and both, and people are whether it's fair or not to despise Biden the way that you despise Trump, because it's definitely not fair. That's the perception of your average voter, right? Mm -hmm. So the polling is not useful right now because most people are not paying attention to news and politics. And I make this point in the book. I lay it out with data. I show people, look, even the repeal of Dobbs barely made made Google's top 10 searches. And it fell behind searches for the Amber Heard Johnny Depp trial because we are living in a society, especially here in America, this is a problem across the world, but it is pronounced here in America, where A, 
50% of adult and eligible adults won't even vote in this cycle. They didn't vote in 2020. I mean, 40%, whatever, right? Mm -hmm. They're not even tuned in at all. And then within that voting element, most of those people are still not, are not reading news or information on the day-to-day -day like we are. So all of the things that we've been following with the coup plot to, to your average voter, January 6th is like the sum and total of, of what happened with Donald Trump trying not to leave power. It's not, they don't know about the coup plot. They don't know about the fake elector stuff. They, they do don't know, know the about the Like we know these things, but average people do not know that. And believe it or not, there are women right now in the state of Florida who are calling in to their local abortion clinic because they need an abortion. And in that phone call is when they are finding out they no longer have the right to an abortion in the state of Florida because of the Republican Party. They did not know that prior. Kate Cox did not know there was a Texas abortion ban until she went to the ER and had pregnancy complications and was medically tortured by the state Republican Party. Like we have to understand our greatest strategic lift this cycle is just getting average people to know what's happening so that they can appropriately freak out. If they don't even know, how are you going to freak out? Even the trial of Stormy Daniels is not resonating. The hush money case is not resonating amongst the electorates. I mean, they're, surely they're watching this. It's a, it's a... My guess is, is no more than 10% of, of, of American voters have ever read or watched a news report about the trial. Oh, wow. Case in point, here is Fox News going into Reno, Nevada and talking to your average voter there. These are people who actually went to a GOP event. So they're, they're hard, they're hardcore. Exactly. Things. They're supposed to be more informed than your average American, right. because my God, there's nobody more activist like than someone who will show up at a political event and a number of people percent wise donate to politicians or to parties or whatever, minuscule, very small. And this is going to surprise our audience. I'll tell you right now, I am so upset. All I want to do is cry. I feel it's a sham. It's a kangaroo court. They're trying to keep him off the campaign. I think it's fair to say that the Trump trial is politically motivated, and I think they are going after the former president to try and s stop Biden from getting kicked out of the White House. Well, I think it's totally misplaced as far as the, the reasons for it. I think they're trying to keep Trump from campaigning. I think it's, it's really a federal issue. It should not be handled at the state level. There's people on all sides of it. There's a, I think, majority out here that will elect him from prison if the Democrats decide to do that. Uh, I, I believe it's a smokescreen. I believe it's a, a ploy to keep the focus on him and not on the horrible way that our, gov our government is being run by our president that should not be there. I just, I just think that it's a, it's, it's, a, it's a crime in itself that what they're doing to him. But it's only making people more sure that, of who they're going to vote for, I think. I think it's turning people back to, to Trump. Trump 2024. I, I think it's a big fiasco. I mostly listen to Fox News. And I know they keep saying that the whole thing is a big joke and there's no rhyme or reason on why they're holding him. I'm a Trump supporter. It's very politically motivated, and that's a little bit of a slippery slope when you start to mingle different legalities with politics and using it in a way, using courts in certain ways. It just doesn't end up good on both sides, and I think we've seen that throughout history and former presidents as well. It's a waste of money. I mean, time after time after time, he, he proves he's right, but they just continue to find something else. They're using it as a scapegoat for their own mis mishandling of stuff. This country's got to change. It has to change. I, I believe totally in Donald J. Trump as our next president. The one we have now is a total mess. I've never seen such a... It, it, it's horrible. I mean, he's really, really bad. He can't think for himself. He has to have... People walk with him now because they're afraid he's going to fall. He can't get a sentence right. He can't get the day right. He can't get people right. He doesn't know where the hell he's going. It's just he doesn't know anything. The man is 81 years old. He should be put in a home for retired politicians. And they just throw away, throw away the key. 
I mean, and that's how the republic ended. Here's a fun fact. Okay, Number one, those are not the voters I'm talking about because these are partisan MAGA people. They are mainlining news. It's just not real news. Right. As the woman said, right. it's all Fox News. And so like what they know about this trial has been filtered through right wing influencers, through right wing media. They have never gone prime to a primary source like a New York Times article or a political article or whatever that talks about what happened in the trial about David Pecker's testimony. They don't do that because they know if they do, they're going to see things mm. that are bad, right? That's a psychological <laughs> tool, right? Yeah. To avoid information that challenges your worldview. And because of that, they have no idea that Donald Trump was working with a, it's a tabloid, but to average Americans, the National Enquirer is news. Okay. That's wow. to them, that's news, right? was not only doing these kill stories for Trump's election purposes, but had a long-standing practice of putting out fake news about their about his political opponent. Right? So if they ever watched or read anything that happened in these Trump trials, they would learn a lot. And that's why I always have confidence in the jury system. The juror, if, if there's a juror sitting on that New York ju jury right now that was open to voting for Trump, what they're learning now is the mechanical way and methodological way that he's a serial con man and a liar. And it's all based on documentary evidence and expert or witness testimony, right? So they're gonna see, they're gonna see what these folks would never look at. And they're never gonna look. But it's really important for people to understand those folks, when they start rounding up Latinos and Muslims who they'll go for first, and then they'll come for the trans people, they're they're all they're gonna be excited. Like that's not. Trump was willing to go into time yesterday or go to time. They've had it all on his website for months. So if you don't believe me, go read Trump.com, the website, Agenda 47, where he lays out in video and transcript really crazy, you know, autocracy plans mm. to transition from democracy to autocracy and do things that are obviously so unconstitutional that he doesn't feel like the Constitution is going to be an issue, right? And, nice. and he's assuming that there will be a... Conviction. Or they can just override uh, it somehow, that there's got enough people there who'll just let him override it. Right. And the, here's the thing is like, I'm hoping, like, like I said, there's women right now in Florida, millions of women who don't even know abortion's been banned in the state, let alone that it was Republicans because they don't read any news or information. I hope you meant if our strategy is to inform the electorate of this key news about what's happening to their freedom under MAGA, that we can motivate them to vote and vote for Democrats. But at the end of the day, Donald Trump realizes that his half of the electorate, like he can be very vocal about what he's going to do because they're all in. They think that we stole the election. Mm -hmm. They've been radicalized. Those people that you were interviewing or that were being interviewed on the stump have been radicalized to believe that Joe Biden stole the presidency, that people like me enable him or are complicit in that theft that the COVID vaccines take your blood permanently. COVID's a hoax, but the vaccines will kill you, right? It's, it's a mass psychosis event. And they're very happy about his aut uh, plans for autocracy because they'd rather, there's a big chunk of the Republican movement here in America that have decided that if it comes to multicultural pluralistic democracy, where they are one of many minority groups and democracy, freedom, versus being protected from that and maintaining hegemonic supremacy as white people, they're voting, they're going to go for B. And they, they want the apartheid state. They, they crave the apartheid state. They want, yes, they, they like I mean, I mean, the, you know, st if anything, the stuff Trump is publicly talking about is mm -hmm. mild. I think there's a big chunk of the Republican Party that would be interested in repealing the Civil Rights Act of, of 1964, mm -hmm. which ended segregation. Like we are really, really at a point where they're, if after 10, 15 years of street propaganda being hyped at these people, they've lost their minds and they're, they see us, at, they see themselves as victims and us as aggressors. And that's exactly, exactly what the Nazis did mm. in Germany to do their stuff. So it's a very concerning thing. It is very concerning because we are just exactly there. I mean, we know that Hitler was stood trial before he won in, this, in, in the second time that he we stood for um, chancellor. And he used the trial in the same sort of way to sort of paint himself as a victim. Um, and even though Trump is clearly coming across as, a, as the world's biggest asshole in the case, 
in the trial itself. All he has to do is step outside every day and say, hey, they're stopping me from going to the campaign trail. They're keeping me here. I mean, I'm being locked into this, into this, into this courtroom every day. And he wins the support of his base, or at least his there, Yeah, I mean, you heard those people at the bottom. I mean, these mm. are the recipients of propaganda, literally verbatim, mm -hmm. echoing talking points yeah. that Trump is using, that MAGA is using, that MAGA, the right-wing media is using, right? Mm -hmm. So it, like when we say public opinion flows from the top down, that, if the Republicans get this and they use their comms to shape public opinion. And so of this idea that Donald Trump is an innocent man is very pervasive on the right. He's not only being per politically persecuted, they are very adamant he's never done anything wrong. Right. Okay? Think about that. Never. Yeah, no, I, I, I see that. So but my concern is that's not going to change between now and the election. You've got these battleground states that are still neck and neck, if we're lucky, but Trump's leading in most of them. What You've got a great prescription in your book. Maybe it's a good time for you to explain some more of that is what do we do to convince that half of the American population that they're, they're wrong when they're so convinced they're right? Well, you can't convince MAGA people, but well, what you need to be focused on is that swing bucket and coalitional turnout. So in my book, gets rid of this idea that there's a persuasion bucket and a mobilization bucket for campaigns to focus on and they have to do student loan forgiveness to mobilize people to vote and then persuade the middle of the electorate about how they're bipartisan and have this great biography and la 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 and they get stuff done. Like that's not how the Republicans campaign. The Republican campaigns have one model. It's one message. Democrats are socialists. They're going to turn your male children into girls or whatever it is now, right? And that message, they're deploying in both in the, into the entire voter universe. They're using that message to drive strong turnout of Republican-based voters, plus right-leaning right, right -leaning independents who always vote Republican. That's what the data shows. But that same message is doing work in that persuasion bucket where instead of trying to sell a product, it's discounting the other product. There's only two products to buy in our system. So Republicans... Ran in, in 2022, half of the map ran good negative partisanship strategy and made sure the electorate heard, hey, Tudor Dixon is a mag extremist who's coming for your freedom. Mm -hmm. But in other places, like in Ohio, there are mil you know, millions of people who cast votes for J.D. Vance. They have no idea that he's a mag extremist. They have no idea how controversial his views in Ukraine are in, um, in terms of women's freedom. Like he, I mean, he's a raging fascist and also a misogynist. They never even ever heard that message from the two so You think there needs to be more of that, more of just going out? Oh, gosh, yeah. The entire strategy across countries. every swing race across the country, from the state house to the house, to the statewide Senate gov, to the presidency need to be running on the, on a strategy that is, is geared towards one thing, making sure voters hear they're under attack, that the Republicans are coming for them, and they have one last chance to save themselves, yeah. right? So it, 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 I, have, I, am, I have confidence that since it worked so good in 2022, it's a lot easier to get people to adopt new strategy now, and that we're going to take that message. I know the Biden team's already running that strategy from the top down, but where my concern is, is on the bottom up. We need to be doing the same things that they did with CRT in Virginia, I lay out in the book, how Republicans you invented an issue, okay? It wasn't even a real thing. It didn't even right. stop. I had never even heard of it, okay? Yeah. Me, I had never heard of it. Yeah. And then 10 months later, it's the top issue of the electorate, okay? And how did that happen? In very, very purposeful, strategic way. They had Glenn Youngkin run on it. Glenn Youngkin, sweater vest Glenn, business guy doesn't give two shits about public education, period, mm. let alone whether white race in school, how race in school is taught. He doesn't care, okay? But strategists told him, Glenn, this is the topic you can wedge to win election, right? <laughs> and so he centered his entire campaign or else he doesn't give two shits about. And then all of the other Republican candidates down below him for the state legislative cycle in Virginia did the same thing. And between them, all centralizing their strategy on this one thing, they made it the most important issue in that Virginia cycle, right? So we, we face that same burden now with Project 2025. We need to get Project 2025 to be 
a household name like CRT. It's gotten a lot of traction. There has been media reporting. We're seeing more and more journalists mentioning Project 2025, doing reporting on it. But until and unless we accomplish that goal in September that your average swing voter in Ohio knows Donald Trump has a plan to purge the civil service, take control of the federal government, and then use it to do whatever he wants to you. Yeah. It is uh, very important that everyone on is on message. Otherwise, we're going to do what we always do, which is try to represent people through our electioneering messaging, where we focus on, OK, the Democratic coalition is heterogeneous and very ideologically diverse. And it's, it's what we call group interest oriented. So women's rights, climate change, whatever. Right. Everyone's kind of got their thing. Yeah. And what we have been doing for the last decade is micro messaging down each little thing. And what I'm saying is, no, no, no. What you need is one message. You're micro messaging everything. You're saying nothing. You're creating a problem because you're not, you don't have the oxygen and you certainly don't have a Fox News media ecosystem in which to center the electorate's mind around the most important thing. You have to do that strategically and where you represent the diversity of our coalition is with political power and policy, not with electioneering, which is costing us from um, keeping us from running effective right. messaging strategy. It's been 24 hours since the Time magazine came out, our article came out. There's not been much reaction to it. It's kind of surprised me. There's been, it's kind of shocking the stuff he says in there. I mean, he talks about ignoring, uh, directing the Department of Justice to do whatever he wants in terms of prosecuting people. So he, if they don't prosecute, person X, if they don't prosecute Joe Biden, if he wants to prosecute Joe Biden, then, then he'll fire the attorney. And that, which is, this is like Watergate stuff. Like we haven't done this in a long time. This is, he's, he's messaging out there. This is policy, but we've not heard the Democrats be outraged about this at all today. I don't think, I think the only thing I think I've heard today is them talking about legalizing weed again, or rescheduling weed into a lower, into a lower category, which makes sense. Sure. That'll bring out some, some, some voters that there may not be as enthusiastic as they might be, but this overall message that we're getting from this criminal who's being in, who's been in court for the last few days, and he's also now suggesting he's going to commit even more crimes as president, is kind of a, you're not get, hearing anything from the uh, Democrats in, in reaction to that. Yeah, I mean, I would disagree. I think you hear plenty from Democrats. Democrats yeah. are the problem. The pro, I mean, until they're doing paid advertising, and like I said, they need to be doing it on this, on this theme, right? But the I mean, problem is, you, like, do you think we should, we should be seeing Joe Biden come out? And this is just a, a, well, he does. He says it all the time. I mean, my God, go watch one of his. Oh, well, I do. I do. He he came out he yesterday more and about said, the threat. But should it be more outrage? Joe Biden. The problem is the media system. OK, yeah, right. so when you say, why isn't there a reaction? I'm going to tell you, like, if Joe Biden had a plan of one of these things that Trump has planned, yeah. it would be saturated, hyper ventilating. Yeah media, beltway media hyperventilation, okay? Yeah. So what's missing isn't Democrats saying, holy shit, the guy's got a plan for autocracy and he's coming right out and saying it. That stuff is happening. Mm. But if it's not covered wall to wall, CBS, NBC, ABC, I'm not talking CNN and MSNBC, certainly not MSNBC. No one watches that. NPR, no one watches that. Mm. Barely anybody watches the three network news channels, right. ABC, CBS, and CNN, plus Washington Post. We're still talking about 15, 20 percent of the country would ever read a thing from New York Times or stumble upon one in nature. But we still need that 15 percent to be told. Donald Trump has proposed the most radical, autocratic, anti-American platform in the American in history. Yeah. Right? And unless the media reacts like that, you're not going to get a public reaction. And you're exactly right. That is the thing that I every night go to bed like, OK, it's great that the narrative is about Florida's abortion ban going yeah. into impact today. Yeah. The media coverage of Trump's trial stuff is great. But there should be utter and total hyperventilation coming out of Beltway Media that probably printed 5,000 articles about Hillary Clinton's email, right? Yep. But just gives him a pass because everything is so crazy that they don't report it. They think, and and it also, Zev, yep. it comes full circle back to the problem I have with working with Democrats on strategy. Mm. There is an assumption in that Beltway media that people already know all this crazy shit about Trump. 
And I'm here to tell you, if you're a journalist listening to me right now, no, they don't. No, nobody <laughs> knows the stuff that he said in Time magazine yesterday. I mean, it's kind of, it's, it's, you can't believe that he's actually saying these things in, out loud. And whether it's, whether it's directing the Department of Justice to, to prosecute his, his opponents, this idea of this imperial presidency. What the fuck is an imper imperial presidency? What does that mean? It's a democracy. Yeah. Yes. I mean, we, we what, what is just taking the federal government, yeah. reconsolidating power back under the president, removing all of the nonpartisan civil yeah. service so that everybody in there is a party loyalist or is willing to do the bidding of the party to keep their job, which will be the bulk of the civil service people, because many of them are just going to get on, get in line when yeah. this change happens because the, they have bills the, to pay, yeah. kids to go I mean, to college. And they're just going to do this is exactly what happened in other countries where this change happened. So, yes, what he is planning is a autocratic presidency. And, you know, if you think federalism will save you, while the Nazis had, I mean, the Germans had federalism, too. And all it took was taking the governorships away and putting in partisan Nazis to governor, govern each of the federal states mm -hmm. in Germany, the German states. And boom, there you go. Federalism, not a problem anymore in Trump is definitely capable of that. The Republican Party is definitely capable of allowing him to be like that. And that's why we really have to watch out because it's not just motive, it's opportunity, right? You need yeah. two things to, to end constitutional government anywhere, no matter how long and embedded your institutions are. Number one, you need a person willing to defy institutions, law, ethics, who's willing to blow through, through those things. Got that there. Okay? Yeah. All right? And number two, yep. you need an accompanying cast willing to allow them to do it. And the Republican Party is that accompanying cast. Yeah. And we know and it beyond a shadow of a doubt because they fucking covered up an insurrection for his ass, right? Yeah. Against them. In other words, they don't, right? It's so, like, it's... we have to take it seriously. And and what sucks, like, trying to get people to understand like, it's not lesser of two evils. It wasn't lesser of two evils in 2020, but it is definitely not a lesser of two evils. One person wants to keep the American institutions that we've had for 247 years going the way they are in all their imperfections, but also all their stability that have made America a leading country, bar none across the world, right? And the other one wants to get rid of all of that and have total power over your life. Yeah. Uh, you know, they could have this, this, this couple of things as I'm looking here that I should mention. The unitary executive theory, like that's another term that they've come up with. What is that? I mean, it's just a term that they've made and they've, they've created this. He sounds so reasonable when he's talking about this. this. He sounds like a reasonable man saying, yeah, well, we could do this and maybe we won't do that. But he's acting like a king if he's actually the president and acting and taking out these, take, and act, making these actions. The other thing he's talking about is impoundment, which apparently is basically taking the power of the Congress to budget for things away from them, which I know used yes. to be something that we could have. But that's, that's a, that is a branch of government that we have, that we are- Well, now... there's a famous saying in poli-sci, intro to 101, mm. right? Where the, and this is to describe separation of powers, yep. okay? And that is the president proposes and the Congress disposes, okay? So what that means, folks, is if they take the power of the person away mm. the constitutionally mandated power of the purse away from congress the president the separation of power that used to exist between making laws mm. and enforcing laws are gone president is an enforcer not a maker now you're probably asking the best person in the country one of them anyway about the unitary executive theory because i'm so well trained in poli sci with my phd in academics i can tell you Unitary executive theory is really something that starts to come into the American lexicon during the George W. Bush presidency and really in relation to his powers to conduct the war in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, particularly Iraq, and also the threat of domestic terrorist attacks, right? And it was put for things like, like okay, the president can order a prisoner of war to be tortured to have his child tortured in front of him to exert a confession. And there's a famous Berkeley legal scholar named John Yu, who I accidentally had dinner with like 15 years later, who suggested you could crush a child's ball legally. If you were the president, you could make that order 
in order to get information to stop a terrorist attack, mm -hmm. right? So there was a lot of legal opining in the White House of legal counsel during the Bush administration about how much, especially the sole organ doctrine, which is the president's power in foreign policy, the sole organ of foreign policy, how much power that really gave to the president. But we kind of see it drift away. Now, Obama, Bush uses executive orders to get around what's starting to become a dysfunctional Congress. It's certainly not at the level it would be just a decade later, but it's starting to function poorly. And so he's doing executive orders to get around the Democratic minor majority after 2006. And Obama kind of picks that up. I mean, initially, he's like, I'm not going to do that stuff. But once he realized the Republicans, are, especially after 2010, have been have rarely adopted a full obstruction. No policy gets done so we can hurt Obama strategy. He turns to EOs too. And of course, Trump turned to EOs. And then of course, Biden had to turn to the most EOs in history because Trump did. And he used EOs to do all kinds of things like eliminate environmental regulations, right? So Biden's first day in office was like going back and flipping a lot of these EOs, okay? What they're arguing now, though, is very different and very distinct from that unitary executive theory, because number one, it's it's taking it out of that foreign policy. So Oregon rule and putting it into the domestic space. OK, mm -hmm. it's also advocating and putting into place a transition model that will erode basically all but erode the role of Congress yeah. in terms of American legislation. It really is shocking when you think about the things he's proposing and the reasonableness on which he's saying these things is sort of why we're not getting a reaction, I think. It's because he sounds like he's, well, firstly, he sounds like he's considering things. In, he is con he's still deciding. So it hasn't quite, it's not like I will do this. He's not acting like the total dictator. But as he is in court these days, he's acting meek and mild and, and accepting what the judge has to say and whatever. But that's just him in court and that's just him uh, in the middle of a campaign. On day one, when he's Mr. Dictator, he's going to be... Mr. Dictator is going to come down really yes. hard, really hard. Yeah, I mean, if I have people, people saying, jail, Rachel, do you really think Trump's not going to leave office? I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? Really? Yes, I just office. want to carry a black card of January 6th and be like, dude, he barely left. We got so lucky. If you understand, and most people, like 95% of people don't understand exactly all the component parts of this process, we got we dodge, we should, we very easily could be sitting right now in a post-democratic America. Mm. It was that close. All he needed was the DOJ to play ball, Raffensperger to play ball. So he, in, he installed well, yeah. Sidney Powell yeah. as a special prosecutor with the power to seize voting machines. But the rest of the DOJ was like, fuck you, we're not going to do it. Mm. Right. So like people think, oh, our institutions help. Yes, they did. Very barely. And Trump and his team of, of fellow autocrats have studied where it failed. And now they have an entire transition model that you can look up online. It's called Project 2025. It's a thousand page model from the Heritage Foundation. It's the same manual that was handed to Ronald Reagan back in 1980 when he made his transformative changes to how government operates. So it's not some leftist group where the memo is just going to sit there. It's never going to be used. And it, it is created by the top minds in conservative politics, and it is detailed, and it is there for anyone to see. And it is our job to make sure that the people that you hang out with, the people you work with, anybody that seems sane in the coalition of the sane, hears about just how much threat they're under, because they will never find that out on their own, and it is up to us to tell them. You know, it's 100% true because I don't think people are thinking about it. And one last thing that I just think is worth mentioning from this time thing, because just people are just not accept, not really understanding it, is he intends to deport 11 million illegal immigrants from America. He's going to round up people in their cities, no matter where they are. People yeah, he who said are, National Guard in. He yeah. said to blue all cities the, all to the military, do it. All the military is even yes. saying, say, but they're not citizens, so he can do whatever he wants, he says. And he's going to yep. round these people up and maybe put them in concentration camps, maybe, or just send them back home. And this is, this is the America that we might be stepping into post-November 5th that I don't think people are really recognizing when they see Donald Trump in court talking about David Pecker's check or whatever it is that they're talking about there. So there's like a, a complete disconnect from, okay, well, that's a reasonable guy sitting in court. He's dirty and whatever, he's an asshole. 
versus this is a guy who's going to like destroy people's lives, rip people out of cities, take them into concentration camps, destroy their livelihoods, destroy our economic system, which relies on these immigrants to do some of this work for, that we're so used to. And then on top of that, fire half the, half, the, half the civil service and all these other things that he's got planned and then prosecute whoever he wants at any, at, at any time. I mean, we're talking about a very drastic, massive shift in the way America exists. It's not uh, like anything we've seen before or will ever see before again. No, it's going to, going to be cataclysmic, not only for Americans, but for the entire world. There's a few reasons why. Number one, the American military is, is as big as the next 10 countries combined, and that's Russia, China, all the other countries. You throw them together, it takes 10. Our massive military has always been, has been used, and now that I've been studying, you know, the World War II period for three years, as a deterrent against global conflict, it could easily be bent to conquest and colonial It's Asian. And if you don't think that the MAGA people have it in them to go back to the third world and start recolonizing some of those countries for their resources, oh, well, I've got a bridge to sell you because that's exactly what their vision is once they have autocratic control. Well, so, if you can let Russia plunge up to Europe, which he says he will, that's what he says he's going to do. Hey, go ahead, army of Putin. Go ahead. You have all NATO. And here's the thing, though, is that it is a uniquely American underreaction, Zeb, okay? Because when you look at public opinion, and there's a poll that even Fox News had on not, not long ago, and it asked people of different countries, different Western democracies, who, which of these people is the biggest threat to global security? And they had Kim Jong-un and Vladimir Putin and all the, your, your very band of dictators, including our dictator or our prospective dictator, Donald Trump. And 41, the plurality, by far the plurality, said Donald Trump is the biggest global threat. So why are people in other countries able to recognize that? But here in America, we're doing diner talks with people who support a coupist, a, a mm. coup water, right? <laughs> like, and acting like it's totally normal thing to do to run a guy who tried to overthrow the government who's facing 91 felony counts and is under criminal investigation as, as president. It's, it's because we are civically illiterate. We have developed a civic culture that is, that, that is intentionally diminishing, right? So you, you are raised to not only not vote, but to think of politics as gross, something you shouldn't even talk about at the dinner table, okay? And like for years, I mean, I'm modernizing democratic election strategy, and it's so ironic, Zev, because I'm using a finding from poli from 1957 and another one from like the 70s or 80s to do this modernization. And those two findings are twofold. Number one, Americans, once they were finally able to be surveyed and tested for their knowledge about politics, it was revealed that they know absolutely nothing aside from who the president is and maybe the party that the president's in. And beyond that, they make all of their decisions based on the party label, P or D and R, right? Yeah. And then the other one is that most independents are not highly informed, engaged people. You got to argue on policy and they're going to be looking a little, this guy is going to be better for my, no, okay? Most of the swing bucket votes because they were socialized into voting in a country where half the people don't vote and they have no interest in politics and news. They don't follow any politics and news and their vote will ultimately be set by a narrative, a top line narrative about the two parties in that race. And that's why getting people off of the old strategy that Democrats use, which minimizes, not just minimizes partisanship, it bleaches it out and pretends like the vote choice is something other than dictated 95% by vote by party and uh, getting people to understand like we are, we, we are, we are the chickens have come home to roost on American political culture. If we are lucky enough to survive this in the fall and because of the Kennedy campaign, that's a 50-50. You -50. <laughs> predicted correctly on the show last time when you put it on your, on your sub stack first that uh, he was going to take uh, voters from both Trump and Biden, and you were 100% correct. There you go. Another, uh, another well done. Thank you. I, you right? I always like when other people can point out I'm correct, because I try not to do that. It makes me look like an asshole. Well, here I am. I'm going to get out again, but you're correct. Exactly. <laughs> you tend to be because right. of Kennedy third-party candidacy and the reality that these votes come down to seven states, like yeah. we have a really big risk of collapsing into autocracy 
the results will be catastrophic. Yeah, I think that's a good place to end it. I mean, it's a terrible place yeah. to end it, but it's where we're going to end it today. Rachel Bittercock, <laughs> thank you very much for joining me on Narrative tonight. Always amazing talking to you and a little terrifying, I must say, but in this case, it, it has to be said and it has to be spoken about. But, you know, it is time to get very real. I think these, the, we've, we, we, don't, we, don't, we have less than, what, 190 days now? Yep. And again, the prescription on nastiness isn't, I'm not asking you to lie. I'm telling you, no one knows what they're up to. The MAGA people and Trump are up to, and you need to tell them the truth. Okay. Don't, you don't have to make things up because his, their real record and their real policy plans are so terrifying. All you have to do is tell people about them. And Rachel's Substack is called The Cycle. So subscribe to that as well. It's also a terrific read and uh, lots of good stuff in there all the time. Thank you, Rachel. Have a good evening. Oh, well, it's great to see you again and your audience again. Bye-bye. One day, you'll tell the story of autocrats, crooks, and kings who came for our freedom. A story of citizens who stood up to tyranny and won. The people prevailed and renewed an old vow to a more perfect union. And that was just the beginning. The story continues. Narrative, where truth lives.